My name is Bob Lazar. I'm known for working at a classified base known as S4 out in the Nevada desert near Area 51. And there we reverse engineered alien spacecraft. I know there are alien craft here from another planet. I Now, I saw other ones, but I was inside one. I know it was not made on Earth. I know it was made with materials that we cannot fabricate, we cannot duplicate, and we've never been able to. I know it uses a power source that's so advanced that you could only dream of something along those lines, and the energy density on it is phenomenal. It's nothing that to, I, I would ever expect to see. Lazar's story is by any standards fantastic. He says he's telling it in order to protect himself. He called right after and he said, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now? And I, I said, well, no. And he hung up the phone. He says he was hired to work at an area called S4, which is a few miles south of Groom Lake. At S4, he says, are flying saucers, antimatter reactors, and other working examples of technology that is seemingly beyond human capabilities. They're trying to make me a non-person. Explain. You called where? Well, the schools that I went to, the hospital that I was born at, uh, past job, and uh, essentially nothing comes up with my name in it. He says he was never told exactly what he'd be working on, but figured it had something to do with advanced propulsion. On his first day, he was told to read a series of briefings and immediately realized how advanced the propulsion was. The power source is an antimatter reactor. Uh, they run gravity amplifiers. There's actually two parts to the drive mechanism. Uh, it's just, it's a bizarre technology. There's no physical hookup between any of the systems in there. Uh, they use gravity as a wave using waveguides. I got to see it uh, actually lift off the ground and operate. The hangars are all connected together and there are large bay doors between each one. And uh, there were nine total that I saw, each one being different. Security at S4 was oppressive, Lazar says, and his superiors used fear and intimidation almost as a brainwashing tool. It did everything but physically hurt me. Put a gun to your head? Yeah. And, and said what? what? Actually put a gun to your head? Well, they, it, they did that even in the, in the original security briefings. They had uh, uh, guards there with M16s and guys slamming their finger into my chest, screaming in my ear, some people pointing weapons at me. Uh, like I said, it's not, a, it's not a good place to work. That fear factor would surface later. Lazar agreed to undergo a polygraph exam as part of this report. Polygrapher Ron Slay asked about the technology Lazar had seen. Did you knowingly lie when you said you had actually seen anti-gravity propulsion in operation? No. The results of this exam were inconclusive. Lazar appeared to be truthful on one test, deceitful on a second. Slay recommended that a second examiner be brought in. Polygrapher no, Terry Tavernetti runs a corporate security operation and is a former Los Angeles police officer. He put Lazard through four tests and concluded there was no attempt to deceive. And I left there thinking that um, I feel we do have some credibility. Well, I am telling the truth. I, I, I've tried to prove that. Uh, what's going on up there could be the most important event in history. You're talking about contact physical <laughs> physical contact and proof of, uh, from another another system another planet another intelligence that's got to be the biggest event in history period and it's real and it's real and it's there after all these years everybody's making jokes that bob was the janitor at los alamos he never worked there okay he's in the phone book I've talked to a bunch of individuals that, were, that knew him from working with him there, but I couldn't go public with it. Finally, I found a brave individual who was willing to talk to me on the record about working with Bob Lazar at Los Alamos in scientific capacity, being in briefings, classified briefings, which by the way, the janitors are not invited to, the highly technical classified briefings with Bob Lazar, and his name was Dr. Robert Krangle. I have all of his documents, all of his paperwork from all the contracts that he did during that time period at multitude of bases, including Los Alamos. During that time, Dr. Krangle's telling the truth. I can prove it. What was your impression of what Bob was doing at Los Alamos in the 80s? I didn't know what he was up to any more than he knew what I was up to. But you did know that he was a physicist? Yes. And that was very clear to you, that he was a physicist at Los Alamos and not, again, like the janitor. Right. So he worked there. 
And he went on record with me and says, of course you remember Bob. He did falsify his educational records, and he's been involved in some other things, and uh, and it just doesn't Are you talking about the what, MIT records? Yeah. Yeah, he explained that to me. He said that he was working on something for the government, at and they sent him to MIT to learn something. And he, I, I can't say too much. I'll tell you off air because he told me not to talk about it. But it makes more sense when you hear his description of it that essentially it wasn't documented that he was studying there because what he was doing was really a terrible thing, a, a terrible experiment they were working on. When I explain it to you, maybe it'll make more sense. His story, it, what's interesting to me is that, again, it's the same story over and over and over again. And then what's also interesting to me is that he knew and took friends to a place where they were testing these things out. And he knew where it was, and he knew when they were doing it, and he brought his friends out there, and that's when they got arrested. When it, when it comes to aliens, uh, there's some things I just can't tell you. Uh, on air. That's the other thing that Bob said that I thought was really fascinating was that there was some documentation that they were uh, showing him that claimed that we are the product of accelerated evolution. And every time I try to be like dismiss Bob myself, there's something that creeps in my mind. I'm like, hold on, hold on. Like I find out that he that he was telling the truth. Like recently, I had it verified that you know he did work at Air 51. Like I know I know I had a guy. I found the guy after 30 years. That, that wouldn't, he wouldn't talk with George, the guy that did his security clearance. Mm -hmm. I found him. I talked to him multiple times about this, and he did clearance for Bob for the test site. But even more recently, from people that have position to access that information, it was confirmed. I just want you to know, he worked out there. Now I have people that were out there that saw him on a Janet flight. Bob worked out there. And a Janet flight is uh, those un unmarked planes that would leave from the uh, Vegas airport and head into Area 51. That's right. Folks who don't know the whole story, just give you a brief synopsis. What happened was Bob allegedly was working on back engineering these aircrafts, these vehicles, these spaceships. And uh, in doing so, you have to have a very high level of clearance. Well, with that high level of clearance comes complete government surveillance. So they monitor your phone calls, monitor everything. Turns out Bob's wife was having an affair. So they don't tell Bob that his wife's having an affair, but they cut off his job. They're like, you're too, you, you're too much of a potential to be emotionally unstable. We can't have you working on these top secret, super sensitive things. Yeah, it's logical. While, yeah, while well, your life is probably going to fall find out apart. Some bad shit. Yeah. So he doesn't know this. And so he's, they don't give him any information, so he freaks out. And so he starts telling his friends. And he's like, come with me, I'll show you the launch, I'm not lying. People forget that. Yes. It, he, he went out and he showed people a craft that didn't look like any normal craft come up right when he said it would, Yeah. over a base that wasn't even known then really well, and a sub base, an area, not Area 51 proper. He, again, he's the luckiest motherfucker in the world. He did it three weekends in a row till he got caught. The most important thing is the human story here. Everybody that he took up there on three separate occasions, they don't all like each other. They don't all talk. They all agree on one thing. They saw something that night at the exact point in time and space that Bob Lazar said, and remember, this is 17, 15, 17 miles south of Area 51. No one even knew really about Area 51. We're talking Papoose Lake, and they all agree. They saw something that night they had never seen before, and they've never seen since right when he said it so that's one of like the six things where i'm like how did he know you can dismiss him i i tried to dismiss it but some things we can't get around because if he's telling the truth that means that the government has been working on these things for decades and decades well i am telling the truth i, I i've tried to prove that uh what's going on up there could be the most important event in history you're talking about contact physical <laughs> physical contact and proof of, from another another system, another planet, another intelligence. That's got to be the biggest event in history, period. And it's real. And it's real and it's... I just want to go over with you what it is that you saw to draw it out for people, to make a sketch. As you're seeing it, as if you're there at that moment, kind of go back in the past. It takes different views to show you different places. 
I'll draw you what the craft essentially looked like. I haven't done this in a really long time. I mean, it had the classic, most of it the classic shape. However, that didn't come out that bad this time. Basically, that's the shape of the craft. It's the thing I termed the sport model. Underneath this floor, there are three, three large cylindrical devices hanging from the floor. These are on mounts that allow them to completely swivel up to 180 degrees and in 360 degree rotation. Directly above each one is a small rectangular object. This is on the floor above. And these are the gravity amplifiers themselves. Looking down from the top, you'd have the center. In the very center, there is a small reactor surrounding this in three equally spaced areas are the amplifiers so this is looking at it sideways this is looking at it down from the top and under these amplifiers underneath on the floor below are the gravity emitters so it's the reactor here powering the gravity amplifiers gravity amplifiers output goes into the gravity emitters at the bottom and the resulting gravity beam or anti-gravity wave can be pretty much put anywhere you want it to. Um, there was another level up here. Now I had access and was permitted to view and look at the operation of this main level with the gravity amplifiers and the level below uh, the gravity emitters. There is a level above which consisted of these two areas that I'm not all that familiar with. I assume these to be some sort of navigational engine. Uh, people call these large black rectangular areas on the top portholes. I believe they were some planar sensor array that just took in information from the surrounding area, whether it be patterns of stars or what have you. Uh, and there was their version of a computer or something to make determinations here that takes input from those sensors and then let the craft know how to orient itself and where it was in space. So that's what I assume to be up there. I don't know for a fact. Again, that was not part of my job and I was only led to believe that. The center antenna is really an extension of the reactor in the center. And that's a waveguide, which allows the, uh, the emission of the gravity wave, which forms kind of a heart shape over the whole, the whole craft. That's how it creates its distortion. These uh, gravity emitters can be swung all the way up to 180 degrees. And this allows the craft to essentially stand on two of them and hover while this one swings up and creates a distortion in front of it, allowing the craft to slide forward. So that's how their low power mode, uh, Omicron configuration operate. The Delta configuration uses all three. And unlike science fiction movies where you see flying saucers just flying along like that, they actually fly belly first. The craft flies along, leaves the atmosphere of the planet, it turns its belly to the destination. The three amplifiers focus in on the destination and that's how it proceeds. So that's basically the operation of it and overall how things were laid out inside the craft. Bob Lazar said the craft operated in two modes, Omicron and Delta. Those two symbols put together form the eye of Providence. There were three seats in here and uh, just around the uh, uh, the reactor. There are no controls, no buttons, no anything. Everything 
has a nice smooth curve to it. There are no right angles anywhere. Everything is exactly the same color. And uh, whether it's metal or some other advanced material, I don't know, again, that was part of the metallurgy division. And uh, all I can say is it felt cold like metal. Um, but it's actual composition, who knows, it was ceramic or, you know, again, some advanced alloy or something along those lines. But uh, the manufacturing technique is unknown and certainly was back then. Um, today, 30 years later, there are things like 3D printing. And now that kind of begins to make sense because it looks like this craft was just built from the ground up like a 3D printer. And that would be about the only way to produce some of the things we saw because there were no fasteners anywhere. It was just all together, not even a seam. So um, I don't know how that was actually assembled is a good question, but I bet it was something along those lines, some gigantic printing mechanism or something we would consider a printing mechanism that actually put this together. When you were allowed to go into the middle and look down into the bottom layer of this craft, what did it feel like to step in? Like, was it instantaneously obvious to you that we could not make this upon walking in the craft? Yeah, it was really, and pardon the pun, it was really unworldly. Everything, <laughs> again, was alien. It really was in that, uh, again, nothing is always completely monochrome in things people build. There is always seams. There's always something other than a radius of curvature. There's a sharp edge. There's some kind of control. Everything was different. There wasn't even wires in this thing as we started to dismantle it. But um, it was more of an ominous feeling because we really didn't know what we were getting into how dangerous it was, and certainly didn't know how dangerous it was to remove anything or change it. Look, I mean, we have energy sources this day and age. You can't just remove caps, you know, off of reactors and have a peek inside and see what's going on. And we really didn't understand the energy source. We had no idea what, you know, a housing might be holding back. So, it was fearsome technology, as I've said before. And, uh, you know, so was it exciting going inside? Not exciting in that way. It was exciting because we were afraid. Uh, and really just looked around inside. The reason for going in was to have a look. There was a little access port here where you could push it open and stick the top half of your body in, hang upside down and look and see the orientation and how the gravity emitters were hanging from the, you know, the floor above. What was your first indication that it was not human? It was not ours. It was not made for us. Well, certainly the size. I mean, this was only about a little over 50 feet in diameter. The only time you could ever stand up would be the middle. So nobody would make something like this. It was extremely uncomfortable to move around in. The seats were not for full-size humans. Everything looked like it was child size. And the access port I couldn't dream of getting through. So there was certainly something smaller operating this. The opening port was like a, 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 hexagon, a hexagon honeycomb with an edge cut out. And if you grab the edge and just pushed a little bit, the honeycombs would all collapse, some sort of flexible metal and all snap open. And I remember seeing, or saying to myself, that's, that's something we could make today. That, that's really, because it has a lot of strength standing on it, but no strength the other way. So you can pop it open, use it as an access port, snap it closed, and it would support weight on it. Uh, something very simple, not that it really stood out. I was standing in a an ocean of alien technology, but I think the reason it stood out was there's something I understand, you know, and nothing. I, I understand anything else. So I kind of grabbed onto that. It's like, I, I see what you did, guys. Here, not anywhere else. Um, so the other fascinating thing was um, it was essentially a pipe. I mean, if you want to just give you analogies, these gravity emitters look like 55-gallon drums and a big, oh, I'd say four inch diameter pipe, oh, maybe 10 inches long, 
can, maybe a little longer, connected the top of the drum to the floor above. It's a solid, thick pipe. Somehow, they were able to manipulate the structure of that pipe where it would just bend as if it was made of clay. So they can apply some form of control to it and have a solid piece of pipe move like a tentacle so they can get very fine movements and adjust and point these things wherever they were and then stop stimulating the stuff and they were locked in place like it was welded on there with a giant pipe. How do you know that they could bend these pipes that way? We did, we had one of these setups in the lab. When you had made adjustments, it would move, it would bend? Yes. That is putting out a gravity wave. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, when we bench tested this setup, yeah, it worked. You know, you've got these seats, no seat belts, and then it goes belly facing where it's supposed to go. How did the occupants you know, not fall out of the seats? What's that about? Well, you're thinking about flying around a single source of gravity below you, and then as you move around, you'll flop, but you're canceling out gravity from every, anywhere else. You're canceling out gravity, inertia, and all other effects, and the only gravity there's going to be is the center is probably going to be the reactor itself. So you're always just pulled and held to the floor here. That's always the ground. So, so no matter how you're oriented, this is always where your pull is. So you'd never even know that you're upside down, you know, in relation to the earth or other things. It creates this field around you, almost heart-shaped, and then that kind of is a cocoon of what we'd call gravity, and it holds you so you can just be inside of that field, and then wherever you end up focusing, that's where you're going to fall to. Right. That's the propulsion. Okay. Now, of course, we never, at least I never had information of us flying the craft at that performance level, but it's assumed that's how it works from the information we, we cleaned. But you saw this craft? Oh, I saw this craft and these work, and you can certainly extrapolate if three of them together worked like this first one, we know how it, how it operated. So there's you know extremely high confidence in that. And the craft that you're drawing here is the one that you guys would take parts out of and work on? Yes. Is it also the one that you saw the test of? Yes. So they were able to take parts out and put them back in. That's no, 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 no. They did not. This flew on two amplifiers. This was already removed. I mean, I should put a dotted line around here. This was on the bench in our room. When I went in there, this was already out. And it still worked. I, I can't imagine how they made the decision to remove that. I'm really glad I wasn't there. At some point you were inside and it was activated and something happened to the inside of the wall. I guess that is an important part. The other, to explain that, around the wall, it was essentially a, a set of archways which were extruded from the wall all around. And we later found these out to be I guess this is a big thing I should touch on. Uh, we found these to be waveguides. And this is how the gravity field was being manipulated. It almost looked like it was just a design element, but it was, it became very obvious that nothing here uh, was done for aesthetics. Everything had a functional purpose. And, you know, even in our spacecraft, Everything has pretty much a functional purpose. There are no house plants or anything just to look at there. But these archways were extruded from the base wall. And for the most part, it seemed they were all the same. But in fact, they were not. One of them, and just putting this here, so they looked like this all the way around. One of them was different, and the one time I was in there, there were other people also working on there in their own particular group. They activated this by some means, and we could see from inside, we could see right through that. I guess the modern day analogy would be a electrochromatic glass, where it's normally opaque, some energy is applied to it and it becomes transparent. And whatever the other group was doing, this panel here, underneath this archway, became transparent. And we can see the 
the hangar outside. They also did something else, and we can see something. The only thing I can relate it to is some sort of writing, some kind of symbols like that. I'm assuming that's some sort of written written language. I, I really don't know. That's, that's a guess on my part. But there were symbols that were displayed here, and then it went back to looking outside. So somebody had a handle on how to control what was going on without any wires or switches. So uh, it was kind of good to see some, somebody was making some progress somewhere. Again, we weren't even permitted information about that and I was fortunate enough just to see it. So, um, now is it possible these other archways uh, did something too? Uh, it could be, I didn't see it, but I know this one, this particular one did. This is an alien spacecraft. Right, right, obviously. Another entity had to make this. Right. Reality simply isn't what it used to be. Really think about it. This is the most powerful technology on Earth. It seems like we have a, a control over the world of physics, you know, but the one thing we can't do is everything related to gravity, force fields, time travel, reactionless propulsion, warp drive, camouflage where you can bend light around things. So yeah, we make movies about all this stuff that we can't do. But um, the thing is, if you can control gravity, that one force, and produce it on demand, all that stuff the same day becomes reality. So you could essentially be invincible just by use of gravity. Look, with ET technology, you can literally rule the world. Well, the briefings were blue folders and just had an overview of the other projects going on that could potentially connect to what we were doing. And there were three in particular. Yeah, our project was Galileo. And the two other ones were, were Project Sidekick and that, that dealt with any other weapon potential of the craft. That, that was the biggest project on the base. The other one was Looking Glass, and that had to do with the effects of gravity's distortion and time, you know, about, you know, potentially being able to get information forward through time. So there were other projects, again, dealing with other aspects of the craft, some biological and, you know, like met metallurgical, things of that sort. But the fact that there is actually a concerted effort to use gravity to actually manipulate time. I actually would rather have been part of that project. Yeah.